Joseph of Westbrook, who's going to be speaking uh, on the no position on the City Council backed uh, preschool measure. So go ahead with uh, up to five minute introduction. Good evening. Um, I'm going to go through about 10 years of why I feel troubled by the city's proposal, but I'm going to focus mostly on three of them. Um, the majority of research shows that college and preschool house children succeed with a K-12, but the research is mixed about how long-lasting those effects are. But the studies don't tell us whether preschool is the most effective thing, or whether smaller class sizes or fully funding kindergarten would be a better uh, use of the money. One of the first issues is the city resolution uh, admits because of various factors, they don't know as yet how many three to four year olds are enrolled in preschool or what types of preschool. It would seem that's the kind of information you might want to know before you put forth the proposition to the voters. I would favor doing the research first and then designing a program and presenting it to the voters. If the city is worried about children in lower socioeconomic status, it would seem the program would be geared to those children. But this proposition would make tax funded, uh, taxpayer funded preschool available to middle class and wealthy families who can more easily afford preschool. So still focusing on the city council, there's two other issues. One is that the city council has just taken on the work of being the metropolitan district for the parks. Does the city council have the bandwidth and the expertise to manage these two endeavors at the same time? Also, this proposition by its very nature of needing to do research to create curriculum to support the program, finding space, creating partnerships, finding and supporting better trained teachers, it's very top heavy with administrators, consultants, bureaucrats. Why is the city working on improving the existing Head Start program rather than embarking on something completely different? My second issue is the involvement of Seattle Public Schools. To know any partnership agreement is going to come after the vote. There's two big issues, space, under the state mandate. Seattle schools has a severe capacity management problem. The district installed 30 new portables this summer. Many schools are revamping their space, including their closets. There is literally no room at the end. As well, the state mandate for SPS is K-12. And as we all know from the Supreme Court's and Cleary ruling, the state is not, uh, the district is not, excuse me, the state is not fully funding K-12 as it is. I don't know how the district can take on the board. The city's proposition talks about the third issue is data collection and data sharing. One issue to understand is it's a new coin in the realm for our country and for the world. For government and business is data collection and lots of it. Between the departments of education and labor, there is a pre-K to age 20 database being created. The DOE counts 400 points of data that can be collected, including discipline records, parental income, marital status, and even health records covered under FERPA, but not under HIPAA. The FERPA law got changed in 2011 to allow educational entities to designate any other entity a legitimate educational interest for data. For example, OSPI had an agreement in 2013 with um, the Seattle Times to share data. The Seattle Times is a for-profit company. And let me give you a couple of names. Target, Instagram, Verizon. They are all companies that experienced massive data breaches. Child identity theft is the fastest growing identity theft in the country. And I know that many of you are thinking, Facebook, the genie's out of the bottle, what can you do? That may be true for adults, but I think most parents would say, I need to be, have the ability to protect my child's identity. The more data on your child that goes out into the educational ether, the earlier it happens, the more likely the more it gets. The other couple of issues. Where do you over the length of the school day? Is it developmentally appropriate for preschoolers to be in what the report commissioned by the city council called a six-hour educational day. While there's research supporting academic gains, there's also research suggesting negative effects for longer preschool days. In Georgia, which has had universal preschool for a decade, they don't require bachelor's degree, and their research shows that teachers with a two-year associate degree do just as good a job. And regarding the curriculum, a requirement for specific curriculum could discourage participation by highly regarded groups that teach Montessori and Waldorf. Those would not be included under this. And lastly, I find it troubling there's no parent campaign for this. The PDC reports $36,000 in spending but only $150 in donations. The city's proposition goes by about four names of campaign website. It's very confusing. confusing. In summary, I think there's a lot of reasons to go concerned. And as a member of the Seattle Public Schools, I shy away from the it's for the kids rhetoric. I do believe this is important by the but voting for the wrong solution for a worthy problem is the not the right thing to do. So let's get this right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So we'll open up to follow-up questions. Elizabeth and then David. <coughs> Could you say why 
to the issue where you've got Head Start, why they're not following the Head Start um, program and creating their own new program? Well, I mean, Head Start is the, the federal um, program. It's had varying degrees of success. Um, but I would say that, you know, the infrastructures are there. I'm wondering why, I, I don't know that the city considered redoing it. I know that one of their consultants who they're using um, works for a for-profit company that's revamping Head Start in Philadelphia. I'm not sure why she didn't suggest that to the city. Did you have a question? Yeah, David. I'm just curious, you said you're a veteran of Seattle Public, public Schools? I, I've written a, a Seattle public education blog for eight years, and I've served on a number of school district committees, and uh, it's, it's kind of my personal thing now to have better public schools. But you have children in Oh, I graduated, family graduated two students from the same public schools. Which school? Um, Which high school? Well, Roosevelt and, and Hale. And, and, but you're not a teacher? I am not a teacher. Oh, and your blog, where would I find your blog? It's, I can give you my card, but it's Seattle School District for me. Okay. And it's her, I think, third time in the Union of Works over the years. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, John. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that the research shows that there's studies proposed to collect data. Mm -hmm. Well, not, not studies. There, there is a, a data collection going on. Data it's embedded data. in this plan. So is that necess kind of necessitates a longitudinal type study? Does well, it not? It, here, on the one hand, yes, you're correct. That is longitudinal. The problem is, is that it depends on what data people are asking for. As I said, there are many, many data points. And you have to wonder sometimes why some people are asking for so many different data points. And as I said, you know, the more people, and they're able to allow more people to have that data, the more worry there is. I mean, Bill Gates created a massive um, student data cloud called Inbloom. Um, and even Inbloom says there is no real way to guarantee security of data. And the problem is, when we were all born, we didn't have to have social security numbers. Nowadays, your child has to have a social security number if you want to declare the one your income tax and so forth. Your child, you might not know as a parent until they're 16 years old that that identity got compromised in some way. And as I say, I, I think that parents need to be able to know what data is going out there about their children and, and why it's going out there. And I think for a lot of parents, particularly um, minority parents, where we see that um, many more minority children, for whatever bad, good reason, uh, have more discipline invoked on them, might not really want to have all these discipline uh, issues put out and, and possibly compromised. Sure, the reason they want that though is if you don't know really what is driving the outcomes, That's true. you want to have as many different factors involved, and you collect data on a number of factors, and then you do like a factor analysis and you can kind of see where they cluster. And that would be, and that's a very valid point. I didn't, it's not all bad. Of course, there's reasons to have data, and there's reasons to um, want to look at all these things together. but. I have to wonder about this idea that you might be veering kids off in sixth grade because you see that a group of kids should go this way. I mean, that's something that they do in Germany. In the United States, I, I would like options to be made open to kids and that they don't get tagged at a certain age because of some data that point that got collected by them. I'm curious, I'm curious what you think. It sounds like there's not an official therapy in the but you are, again, involved with the Seattle schools. What's I'm your, not involved with Seattle schools. I just write a blog about Seattle schools. As a, and as a former parent. And as a former parent, yeah. Um, I'm going to back the answer. What is, your belief, what is your belief about the other initiatives that, that people are talking well, about? Well, you know, I think they're two different things, frankly. I think the other one, it's birth to five, you know. Um, that's a bit, that's child care. And um, I think their idea and I, and I do support this. I think that preschool teachers should be have a career. And I think that many um, people who are career preschool teachers don't make a lot of money. My son went from a fabulous Montessori, and this woman made no money at all, virtually. And of course, 
be capable ten dollars an hour. I think if you want quality, just like if you want quality in teachers, you need to pay for it. Of course, they do need to be better trained. Um, so I, I see that from the other one, the union one, that's what they're supporting as well. But they also have their funding source. I mean, I don't quite myself understand legally what happens if that one passes. Is the city obligated to fund it? I don't, you know, that's that's a question I would ask the county or the city. What do we do about that? Um, uh, my, my main issue about it is I really wish, and I went to the city council meeting when this got voted on, I really wish the city could have worked with these people who are the frontline people and come together and like, what is the best thing that we can do since we're all interested in having better outcomes for all children? And that didn't happen. And I have to tell you this uh, double way of voting on the ballot. I have to call King County elections tomorrow because I'm not even sure I quite understand how you vote and what the outcome will be. And so I, I just wish, you know, if we work together, we might have one thing that we would all support together. Ken, do you have a question for earlier? I just am um, confused because I feel like we're doing a, a, I actually really, first of all, I want to say I really appreciate a lot of the points you brought up. I thought many of them were, were quite good. I am confused in some ways about the the, the way in which you talk about data and it's, it's being tracked and kids being tracked, and I don't see the connection. I feel like I don't know how we got from point A oh, to point B. Oh, because on that. it's embedded in your plan. It, it talks about data sharing, and I mean, it, it may not be discussed in a big way. I'm pulling it out at this point because it's, you know, one thing that's happened when I started this blog, it was really about Seattle Public School. But is that public education has gotten bigger statewide and nationally? Data collection is a huge issue. Yeah, okay. and that, that's, that's not my question. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> Sorry. Because I, I. How did I get here? I pulled it out of here. No, the question I have is uh, you then start talking about how they'll use data to track kids like they did in Germany through schools, and I didn't know how you got to. I understand why they're collecting data. Mm -hmm. I understand the end the, the potential that they could anonymize data, they can aggregate data and have sort of look at trends, you know, and we can we can as we move this moves forward or any of these have have very legitimate. What I was curious about was how you got from collecting data to kids being tracked. Well, I mean that is part of the, the national discussion about data collection about public school students. Um, is what are we going to use it for? Um, what are some possible outcomes? That's one that's been discussed. That's one that troubles me because maybe because is I it part of this plan? Where is the problem? Okay. Nobody knows for certain. Nobody knows what the federal government is going to do with all of its pre-K and age 20 uh, data. I mean, our state is, is tracking. They have their own database, and the, the feds do. It's a hard thing to say, and I think it's better right now that we have this public discussion. What is it we're going to use this data for? Because, as I said, FERPA law has changed. Anybody can have access to data, even for-profit companies. And that's where you get into a trickier issue of, okay, well, what are they using it for? The, the, the goal might be um, more um, personalized learning, better products, absolutely. But the flip side to that is pretty troubling. And I, I think it's, it was worth it to me to bring up. Yeah, there. Um, one thing that disturbs you is, is the fact that they didn't consult community colleges who run programs for, for young children and, and local people who would know what is wanted here. Well, let me just say, I don't know that for certain. That they, I'm not saying they didn't consult those people. I've heard that they did. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, I just from. wish that the union who represents these people at the AFT had perhaps had some issues. You know, had maybe yeah. it had worked, worked out better. Um, one thing I'm curious about, I I, um, I took a look at the <coughs> chart that was showing the graduated uh, amount that people would pay for tuition as their income goes up, and so mm -hmm. the income goes up uh, $5,000, and you would think that every time the income goes up $5,000, that there would be more or less the same increase in the amount of tuition, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not. It kind of skips around a good deal. And also going across, as the number of people in the household increases, mm -hmm. there are some quite significant differences between. Do you have any idea 
what the explanation is for that. I don't. You'd have to. You'd have to I'll have to ask the one, people who come. But one, but one thing to note about that is, as I said, you know, we're trying to reach children who don't traditionally have access to preschool. Mm -hmm. I can tell you just from what I understand, one of the reasons they want to have this graduated fee schedule is because you absolutely, to get the very best outcomes, you need a diversity of income levels, socioeconomic yeah. levels, levels in that classroom. Right. If they don't get buy-in from especially probably middle class families, um, it will be a very difficult thing to get the best outcomes, and then it may get for better or worse, right or wrong, get branded, you know, that's the low income preschool. Mm -hmm. The city has the low you know, preschool for low income kids. I don't know if that's really worth it. That is one reason why I think that they want to make it high quality, but I think, I wish the work had gone into considering what that looks like and what that's going to, well they did do research, but I mean exactly how are they going to get there um, with them admitting, as I said, that they don't even know the number of kids in Seattle Public School, or excuse me, in Seattle, three and four year olds that are in preschools and what kind of preschools they're in. I mean, you seem like you need that baseline information to go where you need to go. Mm -hmm. Time for maybe one more question. <laughs> or a sneeze. Excuse me, I'll be right with you. Oh, pardon me. Okay. Any uh, final questions from us? We've got about two minutes left if you wanted to sort of make closing comments. Well, um, I've forgotten that I have closing comments. Um, you know, I, I, you know, a couple of other issues. You know, they want to have um, dual language programs, which are really great. I can tell you, in Seattle Public Schools, it's really costly, and and again, you're going to be putting more money probably at an administrative level because you're going to have to organize that. Um, the other thing is the eligibility priority will give the children who live in available program classrooms and it seems sad that where you live in the city is going to determine if you're going to be able to get into one of those preschools. Um, so <coughs> I, I think that of course it's a, it's a good idea. I think we all support it. I just don't feel like this is the, you know, I think this is a great document. I think they have done, brought together some research, but I don't think they brought enough research about our city and the children that are in the city and how it is all going to play out. But as I said, they are absolutely going to need to get those middle class parents into these programs, and I worry about that ability um, to communicate to people what this is going to look like and, and why they should send their children to this.